Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky and see your hand in time in mind to lead me through the night. We continue today in our series for this entire month entitled Independence, Not So Much. Disciples, Joyful Life of Surrender. We began last week, as our second session this week. In 1777, the city of Philadelphia celebrated the first anniversary of our country's independence. They did so with an official dinner for the Continental Congress. They did some 13-gun salutes. There were speeches, there were prayers, there were parades, there were troop reviews, and there were fireworks. And we've been celebrating similarly every year since. Americans love our independence. Liberty, freedom, self-rule, and self-determination, self Reliance. In this country, we are people who celebrate and propagate our self-determination. While we surely embrace the need for government services and safety, likewise there's an independent spirit. We cherish individual freedoms and self-rule. Consequently, because of our love of independence, when we consider Christianity, Americans naturally gravitate toward the elements of Christianity that fit with our desires for independence. We we love when we read the mission of Jesus Christ when He said, I came to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We Americans enjoy the the liberty method and message of Jesus Christ. We love it that Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Americans enjoy the freedom message. So in that subject of independence is promoted in Christianity. We American disciples are quick to embrace that message. Freedom is a concept that we celebrate. And absolutely, that is a good thing. But as we mentioned even last week, when we follow the Lord Jesus according to the fullness of His Word, we discover that Liberty and freedom aren't the entire message of Christ Jesus and His work in this world. For biblical disciples, there's another side to the independence coin. And strange as it may sound, that other side of the coin is surrender. Surrender. To cease resistance and submit to authority. To yield to the power of another. Surrender. To give up completely and abandon oneself entirely to. In, in biblical discipleship, surrender is the other side of that independence and freedom coin. Of course, The challenge with independence and surrender is they're on opposite sides of that coin. Yet, they are both intended for the Christian's life. As with many opposites, finding the balance isn't always easy. And there's times when our independence pushes us to resist against God rather than surrender to Him. The Apostle Paul explained to Timothy that when I resist the Lord, I'm really limiting myself. When I'm independent rather than obedient, God isn't suffering. I'm the one who suffers. Resistance ends 
my progress in the kingdom of God. But, but disciples of Jesus are followers. And the truth is, we're not following if there's no progress. The disciples have to learn to live in proper independence while also living in proper surrender. But preacher, some might say, surrendering can be difficult. If you're interested on some thoughts on how to make surrender easier, you go to www.livingfaithtabernacle.org and you listen to last week's sermon. There you'll find it. As we're learning in this sermon series, surrendering to the Lord Jesus exists in layers. And as we ministered last week at the very core of following Jesus is surrender to His power. The life of discipleship all starts with surrendering to the Lord's authority. Having done that, having surrendered to His ultimate authority, then there are additional layers of surrender. We surrender to the Lord's precepts or His instructions. We surrender to His promises or His blessings. We surrender to His principles or His values. And finally, we surrender to His people or the body of Christ. And every Sunday this month, we're discussing a different layer. Today, our topic is surrender to the Lord's precepts to the lord's precepts what do you what do you mean by precepts a well, precepts is a word that means a commandment or an instruction it's an intended rule of action that's given with authority in religious framework precepts is usually a command respecting moral conduct in everyday language, it means this. Precepts define our morality. Precepts, if you will, are morality in action. Morality is simply what we believe is right and what we believe is wrong. What's good and what's bad. Our basis for the way we make decisions is our morality. And the way we describe our morality is through precepts. Morality in action, in practice. What we believe is lived out in practice through precepts. Now I would submit today that loving relationships extend. Loving leadership extends morality to those following through precepts. Loving leadership extends a right way of living to the people that leader loves through precepts. Maybe it looks more like this in the day-to-day. -day. As a parent, parents are constantly issuing our children instructions. We take the time to instruct our children because we want the best for them. Ideally, we want them to skip the mistakes that we've made as adults. Our instruction in for our children is to better their lives. And so we are constantly sharing information with our children. We, we share with them the need to brush their teeth and how to do so. We teach them to clean their room and how to do so. We instruct them to politely address adults and how they would phrase those words. We teach them how to properly treat their siblings. We teach them when to be quiet and when it's fine to be loud. We teach them to sing and to worship during church and elsewhere also. We 
teach them to pray, not just by our example, but in practicing with them. You see, parenting precepts are seemingly endless. You don't believe me? Talk to the parent of a preschooler or a grade schooler. You don't have to listen to the words. Listen and look at how tired they are. It's an ongoing effort. And yet as parents, sharing those instructions, giving those guidelines, issuing those precepts, we expect our children to follow all of the instruction that we share. Why? Because we want to better their lives. Because of our love for them, loving parents, they don't attach, we don't attach a threat of separation with each instruction. Think about it. Loving parents, we don't follow instructions to our children with this. Or I'm going to throw you out of the house. Pick up your clothes off the floor. Or you're out of here. You're on the street. Brush your teeth. Or I'm changing the locks on the door. Now we might feel like it. But we don't say that. We don't issue the threats of separate. Are you with me? We don't threat separation every time we issue instruction. Because we're loving parents, we continue to guide, we continue to lead, we continue to train, because we expect, hopefully, they'll follow all of our instruction. Hopefully, they'll realize it's for the best of their life. It would be silly to threaten to throw them out over every bit of instruction. Now, just because we don't threaten to toss kids out of the house with every instruction doesn't mean the instructions are worthless or unimportant. Listen, if, if your mom and dad don't threaten to make you a homeless child if you don't brush your teeth, that doesn't mean that brushing our teeth is unimportant. Parental intention for good doesn't have to be validated by threats of punishment. A loving parent shares wisdom with the genuine hope that their children are going to obey every last instruction. Why do they do that? So that our children will be blessed. So that their lives will be better off. Likewise, the Word of the Lord is His morality extended to humanity. This is His eternal wisdom that's intended to make my life better and to make your life better. The Lord's precepts are the result of His loving leadership. Can I remind us this afternoon that the Bible is not a book of suggestions. It is a book of holy and eternal wisdom. Every instruction is blessed. Every command is for our benefit. All of this is at the Lord's expectations. And like a loving parent, the Lord doesn't need to follow every precept with a threatening consequence. Word of the Lord, every instruction and every guideline, the Lord doesn't say, add this to your life or you're going to hell. Every instruction in this book isn't followed with, or your salvation is over, pal. It's silly. 
The Lord's morality isn't revealed like that if God didn't expect us to pursue His directions. He wouldn't have shared them in the first place. If any of these precepts were important to God, why would He make the effort for them to be passed from century after century? If His commands were only suggestions, why go to the trouble of handing them down through time? whether or not the Lord's precepts include consequences. He has shared them for our benefit. The Word of the Lord. It's His morality extended to humanity. His precepts. His morality in action. This book records the Lord's eternal effort to better our Lies. This book. From the very, very beginning, check in the scripture in Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 16. The scripture in Genesis, after creating man and placing him in the garden, the Lord began his quest right away to direct. Humanity. Man's created. He's put in the garden. And in Genesis 2, we read this. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, that one carried a consequence. But from the very beginning of the creation of man, the Lord began to issue His precepts. Here is how we will place my morality into action in humanity. And later on through Scripture, he reinforces and further develops the thought. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 1, Scripture records, now this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you to teach that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. In verse 2, fear the Lord, keep all His statutes and His commandments all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. In verse 3, observe them carefully that you may multiply greatly. In verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In verse 6, in these words which I command you today. You see, from the outset, the Lord has issued precepts to better our lives. He's communicated His morality so that our days would be prolonged. Centuries later, Jesus Christ comes on the scene. And some would have us believe, well, when Jesus got here, it's no longer about commands and directions and precepts. It's just about forgiveness and love. And yet Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 21, He who has My commandments and keeps them, it is He who loves Me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. He who has my commandments and keeps them. A chapter later, Jesus said, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Just as a parent shares precepts expecting them to be followed, so does our loving Lord. But here, here's a challenge we face. Independent Americans like us have problems with precepts like this. Americans tend to embrace their independence far and above their surrender to godly precepts. Earlier today, taking prayer, Don mentioned a dollar bill. In our currency, there is a phrase put there by the founding fathers when they started making money. It says, in God 
we trust. As a country, our leading fathers put that to be part of our currency. In God, we trust. But America has changed significantly since then. If money was created today, would we include that phrase? I, I wonder if indeed we would. Because America no longer surrenders its morality to divine authority. It's not the way America works anymore. Instead, today in the USA, morality is devi- defined by the majority. What's right? is defined by the most people who think it's right. What's wrong is defined by the majority who feel like it's wrong. And as defined by the majority, what's right today could be wrong tomorrow. Oh, preacher, you're exaggerating. Really? Decades ago, it was fine and dandy and promoted to smoke cigarettes. Smoke them by the pack. Smoke them as much as you want. Smoke them at work, smoke them at home, smoke them in a restaurant, smoke them everywhere you want, because the majority was happy about smoking. Those who became addicted and hooked to smoking are disappointed today because they're no longer in the majority. Now the majority has turned the tide, and what was good before is bad today. You with me? Because it's not defined by divine authority in our country. In our country, it's defined by majority. As a whole, our country prefers morality by the majority. And when the Lord is no longer in the majority, then America no longer surrenders to His precepts. I remind us today, disciples of Jesus don't find their morality in the majority. We find our morality in the Lord's precepts. Of course, what's happening in the country is the multiplied effect of what happens in individuals. More and more, morality, right and wrong, is not defined by some outside source, some outside authority. More and more, what's right and wrong is defined by the individual themselves. We're told time and time again, whatever is good for you. Well, therefore, there can be as many moralities as there are individuals. And with multiple moralities, you know what happens? What happens is what we see today. The social chaos we witness today. The political chaos we witness today. The battles that are going on. The so ridiculously challenging work of politics and law is they're trying to manage the certain conflicts that come when what's good for me is bad for you based on individual moralities. America has raised the authority of the individual. It's diminished our acceptance of morality from an external source. And diminishing outside authority devalues the Lord's precepts. When I elevate me, I'm devaluing and demoting the Word of God. Disciples of Jesus, we don't define morality individually. We define our morality by these divine precepts. As children mature from little ones on into older ages, Their understanding increases. And as time goes on, their mental development, their life experience allows them to understand the reasoning behind precepts that their loving parents share. But prior to maturity, prior to understanding, a child doesn't fully comprehend that her parents are directing her for her own benefit. So for many children today, their first words are not mom or dad. It might be no. 
And most certainly an early word is why. And they don't say it just once. Why? No, I want you to do this right now. Why? I want you to do this right now. Why? That's why the tool of the parent is the broken record. Why? Just do what I said. Why? Just do what I said. Why? Just do what I said. Children today don't even know what a record is, but some of us old folks just keep repeating the precept, repeating the precept, repeating the precept. Why? Because the children can't. It's not that they won't understand. They cannot understand. As Mark Twain famously said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. Our generation has been taught to ask why. We've been taught to discover the reasons behind the actions. And that's really good because to understand the meaning behind the instructions, there are times we find out that there are new processes and better solutions to the problems of before. But that desire and drive to always have a reason before we follow the precept can really throw a wrench in following God. Without reason, we might hesitate or even refuse to follow instructions. The pursuit of reason can hamper faith. We become so enslaved to reason that we lose our ability to trust. Yes, there are times naturally when our limited knowledge and our experience won't allow us to understand the reasons behind certain instructions. For instance, the day may come for some of us in here that are studying these things. Maybe there'll be a day when we fully understand airflow and vacuum and lift and the dynamics of flight. But we don't have to understand those things in order to fly with Alaska Airlines. Until we understand those principles and those reasons of physics and dynamics, until then, we trust that engineers and mechanics and pilots understand those meanings so that you and I can go ahead and fly. We trust their wisdom, our need for reason. If we don't trust their wisdom, is that we won't fly. Reason can limit our faith. That faith and trust are necessary for discipleship. Faith and trust allow us to proceed when we don't fully understand. Faith and trust accept the fact I'm not always going to know the reasons behind the instructions. Faith and trust accept someone else knows more than me. Someone else understands more than me. And I trust the instructions they're giving me. I Faith is in the guidelines they're sharing with me. And I'm willing to follow the guidelines of someone wiser so that I can go forward. You see, the disciples' faith is in the Lord's authority, in the Lord's wisdom, in His eternal knowledge, and not in my human reasoning. American problems with precepts. Well, knowing those things, what, what should disciples do? Those things are battling against our surrender to the Lord and Savior. What should we do in response? You know, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but for disciples, hear me, understanding comes after we surrender to the precepts. 
Reasoning says, when I understand, I'll follow. But the Word of God says, follow first, and then you'll understand. In the Scripture in Psalm 119 and verse 100 is one of many verses that the Lord shares with us. Note what the psalmist penned. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Keeping the precepts came before the understanding. In verse 104, he says this, through your precepts, I get understanding. It was by the precepts first that understanding comes afterwards. In 98 of the same chapter, you through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. There is something about the kingdom of God and the work of God and the way God works with humanity. But first, we surrender to the Lord's precepts and we understand and recognize wisdom will follow that obedience. I, I preach today to Americans. I, I preach today to those that have embraced independence as part of our social and political structure. We don't approach the Lord of glory with an independent spirit saying, you explain it and then I'll do it. No, my friend. In the kingdom of God, we say, I'll do it. I trust you and I'll understand it by and by. By surrendering first, we follow the example of so many disciples throughout the course of Scripture. If you want all of these references, I'll give them to you later. But the Bible says Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Abraham did as God commanded him. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them. All the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded. As the Lord commanded, so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded. I preach today, when you and I surrender to the precepts of the Lord, we're in some really good company. David did as God commanded him. Job said, I've not departed from the commandment of his lips. Jeremiah reported, so I went as the Lord commanded me. Ezekiel said, so I did as I was commanded. The New Testament, Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded. And what about those first disciples? Those original twelve, Jesus gathered round Him in Matthew 21 and verse number 6. The Bible records, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. In fact, they were merely following the example of the One that they were following in John 14 and 31. Here's what Jesus said, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave Me commandment, so I do. We're in some great company when we decide I'm going to surrender to the precepts of a loving Lord. I preach today that we should follow their example and surrender our lives, our wills, our determination, our decision making, our morality, our precepts unto His divine precepts. Our declaration ought to be like King David's in Psalm 119 again. And verse 128, David said, Therefore, all your precepts Concerning all things, I consider to be right. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things, I consider 
to be right. You know, it's through surrender that you and I can overcome the hindrances that Americans face. Through surrender, we overcome majority morality. It's in surrender that we conquer individual authority. Surrender to His precepts accepts, you know what? He has eternal wisdom for my life and I'll never do any better than what I find in these precepts. I'll never be any more successful in what I discover in His guidelines. Why would we do that? Why would we surrender before we know for sure? Why would we surrender before we have crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's? Why would we surrender when I can't fully explain everything He's asking me to do and not do? Why would I surrender? David again explained like this in Psalm 119. Verse 40, David said, Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. In verse 45, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. In verse 93, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I submit via Scripture today that the reason to surrender to His precepts is that life and liberty and righteousness are in these precepts. That life and liberty and rightness are in His morality? Are you struggling with some kind of bondage? Are you hindered by something that's holding you back today? Are you in need of liberty? Are you wondering about your life? Are you concerned about your future? Can you not decide the right thing to do or which way to turn? I preach today in surrendering to the Lord's precepts, we enjoy life. In surrendering to the Lord's precepts, there is liberty. There is righteousness. When I surrender, there's more reason than that to surrender. In John 15.10, Jesus reiterates some power in surrender. He said, if you keep My commandments, you will abide in My love. Just as I have kept My Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Following His commandments, keeping His commandments, allows continuing in godly love. It opens the door to persisting in heavenly love. Living in the love of our Lord and Savior. I preach today, are you feeling unloved? Are you wondering who really cares about your life? Is there a question in your mind about the concern of someone or anyone? I preach today, surrender to the Lord's precepts and His commandments. Surrender to His wisdom for our lives because in our surrender, we discover His abiding love. There are many more, but I share just two more. Living in His love brings this confidence in 1 John 2 and verse 3. The Apostle wrote this, Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. We know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Confidence, assurance, certainty, 
We know. I wonder this afternoon if some here have been unsure. I wonder if there are men or women, young or old, who have struggled with faith, who are having doubts about the questions about the Lord and His work in our lives. Can I say today on the power of His holy Word, surrender to His instructions. Yield to His precepts because in our surrender we find assurance of our relationship with Him. In surrender to the authority of His Word, we know that we know Him. And if for some reason any are still unconvinced of surrender's benefits, I want you to see this last passage of Scripture here today. In the book of Revelation 22 and verse 14. John the Revelator in the final words of Scripture. Pens blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. In Genesis, at the dawn of creation, in the beginning of this book, the Lord directed man by His precepts. And then in Revelation, at the closing, pointing toward eternity, the Scripture says those who surrender to the precepts of our loving Savior, have the right to the tree of life and are ready and given ready entrance into His heavenly city. Have you been unsure about eternity? Have you been wondering about your final destination? Oh, today, if we'll surrender to His precepts, disciples enjoy the right to the tree of life. Disciples enjoy the privilege of entrance into the gates of the city. All through surrender. It starts, the core is surrendering to His ultimate power and authority. That next layer is to surrender to His precepts. His selection of the best way to serve Him successfully in this life. So important to Him that at the dawn of creation, man still smelling like a new car. In a brand new garden, before things get rolling, the Lord starts giving direction. The best way to do this Would you bow your heads across this auditorium here today? As we mentioned last week, a long time human symbol of surrender is the simple raising of our hands. With eyes closed, folks thoughtful and praying about the Word and acknowledging the Spirit of the Lord in this place. I'm calling people, I'm calling those who desire to surrender, to issue signs of surrender unto the Lord. Not for me, not for the preacher to look around and count hands. It's not what it's about today. And I'm calling for men and women who will raise a hand of surrender saying, Lord, I surrender to Your life and liberty that You You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of the series, or join us online at livingfaithministries.church.
ghost you give me peace